Hello everyone, today we'll be going over mathematics, October, November 2021, paper 5-2. This is probability and statistics first, and we have a time limit of 1 hour and 15 minutes. So let's get started. Each of the 180 students at a college plays exactly one of the piano, the guitar, and the drums. The number of male and female students who play the piano, the guitar, and the drums are given in the following table. So... The gender is divided male and female and we're given three instruments piano guitar and the drums now a student at the college is chosen at random find the probability that the student plays the guitar all right so we require the probability that the student plays the guitar right and for guitar we're given two numbers so 44 of the students are male and play guitars right and then the 38 of the students are female and play the guitar. So the total number of people, regardless of the gender, playing the instrument guitar is 82. And the total number of students in the college is 180, which means that the probability that the student plays guitar is going to be 82 divided by 180, which is equivalent to 0 0.456. Now, for the second part, we need to find the probability that the student is male, given that the student plays the drums. So that's the probability of the student being male, given that the student plays the drums. Now, from the Bayes' theorem, the formula for this probability is going to be that the probability of the student being a male and playing a drum divided by the probability of student playing the drum. All right. Let's look for the numerator part first. So that's student being a male and playing a drum. So male is given right here and drums is given right here. And we're looking for the intersection of both of these events, which is given by 11 out of 180, right? Which means that the probability of the student being a male and playing a drum is going to be 11 out of 180. Now let's look for the probability in the denominator. So that's the probability of student playing the drums. So that's similar to what we figured out in the first case, right? So we need to sum the number of students playing the drums regardless of the gender. So that's going to be 11 plus 20, which is going to be 31. So that's 31 out of 180 students who play the drums. Now let's substitute these values. So that's going to be 11 out of 180 divided by 31 out of 180. So we can just cancel the 180s. That's going to be 11 out of 31, which is equivalent to 0 0.355. All right, for the third part, we need to determine whether the events, the student plays the guitar, and the student is a female are independent justifying your answer okay whenever we're talking about two different events so in this case that's the student playing the guitar and the student being a female and we need to figure out if this event is independent or not so the case for independent how we're going to justify it is that if the probability of the student being a female and playing a guitar is equal to the probability of student being a female into the probability of student playing the guitar, then that's going to be independent. And these two events will not be independent if the probability on the left hand side is not equal to the probability on the right hand side. All right, now let's look for the probability on the left hand side first. So that's the probability of student being a female and playing a guitar. So we're looking for the intersection of these two events. So female is given right here and guitar is given right here. So the intersection is going to be 38 out of 180. So that's going to be the probability. 38 divided by 180. Now let's look for the probability of the student being female. So we just need to sum all of this row. Right? We're not looking at the instruments. We're just looking at the number of females so that's going to be 42 plus 38 plus 20 which gives us the total number of females of 
100. So that's going to be 100 out of 180. Now let's look for the probability of student playing a guitar. We already found this probability in the first part. So that's just going to be 82 out of 180. Now let's look for the value in the right hand side. So that's just multiplying these two probabilities together. So this is going to be 100 divided by 180 into 82 divided by 180. This gives us the total of 41 by 162. So we can clearly see that the probability on the left hand side is not equal to the probability on the right hand side, right? So this is not equals to probability of the student being a female into probability of the student playing a guitar. This means that the two events are not independent. So this concludes the first question. Let's move on to the second one. A group of six people is to be chosen from four men and 11 women. In how many different ways can a group of six be chosen if it must contain exactly one man? All right, so we have a total of 15 people, right? And out of these 15 people, four are going to be men and 11 are women. And we are choosing six people out of the 15 people. And we need to figure out in how many different ways can a group of six be chosen if it must contain exactly one man. So out of six people, one must be man, which means that the remaining five people must be women, right? So we're just choosing this. So number of ways, we are to select one man from four men, right? So that's going to be 4C1 into and the remaining five people must be women. So we must select five women from, from the total of 11 women. So that's going to be 11C5, which gives us the total number of ways of 1,848. Let's move on to the second part. Two of the 11 women are sisters Jane and Kate. In how many different ways can a group of six be chosen if Jane and Kate cannot both be in the group. So we're looking for the case where these two sisters are not together, right? And whenever we're talking about not together, it is easier to find if we uh, already figured out the entire number of possible ways without any restrictions and subtract the number of ways in which the group of six can be chosen with both the sisters together. So we just need to find the number of ways in which both the sisters are selected. In which both the sisters are chosen or selected. So this means that out of the six people in the group, two are going to be Jane and Kate. So that's for sure, right? Then it just means that we need to select four if the total was six and two are already selected, then the remaining numbers to be chosen is going to be four. Similarly, for the total number of people, so before it was 15, right? But out of the 15, two are already chosen. So that means that the total number is reduced to 13. So basically, we just need to select four people out of 13 people. So that's going to be 13C4, which is 715. Now let's look for the number of ways of forming a group of six. So this is the case without any restrictions. So we just need to choose six people from a group of 15 people. So that's just 15C6, right? Without any restrictions. This gives us the total of 5,005. But we need to find the different ways in which the both sisters cannot be in the group. So that's just subtracting the number of ways in which both the sisters are in the group from the total number of ways of forming a group of six. 
So the required number of V's is just going to be the total V's, 5,005, minus the way in which the two sisters are to be together in the group. So that's 715, which gives us the final answer of 4,290. This brings us to the end of the second question. Let's move on to the third one. A bag contains five yellow and four green marbles. Three marbles are selected at random from the bag without replacement. So without replacement always indicates that this is going to be hypergeometric distribution. And in hypergeometric distribution, we always use the combinatorial. So that's the key to remember here. All right, now we need to show the probability that exactly one of the marbles is yellow is going to be 5 by 14. So we have the total of 9 marbles, right? And out of the 9 marbles, 5 are yellow and the remaining 4 are green. And we're selecting 3 marbles. And we need to find the probability that exactly one of the marble is yellow. So probability one marble is yellow. So this just means that out of the three marbles, one has to be yellow, then the remaining two must be green. So where to select one yellow from the total of five yellow marbles, so that's 5C1 into, then we are to select two green marbles from the total of four green marbles, so that's 4C2. But since we're figuring out the probability, we need to divide by the total number of ways in which the three marbles can be selected without any restriction. So that's just selecting three marbles from the total of nine marbles, which is going to be 9C3. All right, now this gives us the total probability of 5 by 14, which is required. So that's correct. Now the random variable x is the number of yellow marbles selected. We need to drop the probability distribution table for x. All right, we know that the total marbles we're selecting is three and out of these three there can be all three green marbles which means that there will be no yellow marbles so x can have a value of zero and x can have a value of one right because out of the three marbles one can be yellow similarly out of the three marbles two can be yellow so that's the value of two and the final case would be to have all three marbles of yellow color so that's three all right now we just need to figure out the respective probabilities so for zero, like we said before, we are to select zero marbles from the total of five yellow marbles. So that's going to be 5C0. And out of the four green marbles, we need to select three green marbles. So that's 4C3 divided by the total possible selection. So that's just 9C3. This gives us the total value of 1 by 21. So that's the probability for the value of X being zero. Now for the value of x being 1, we already figured that out in the first part, which is 5 by 14. Now let's look for the value when x is 2, which means that out of the 3 marbles, 2 are yellow. Out of the 5 yellow marbles, we need to select 2 yellow marbles, so that's going to be 5c2 into. Out of the 4 green marbles, we need to select 1 green marble, so that's 4c1 divided by the total selection of 9c3 which gives us the total value of 10 by 21. So that's the probability for x having a value of 2. Now for the last case, that's 3 marbles being the color yellow. It means that we need to select 3 yellow marbles out of the 5 yellow marbles, so that's 5C3. And if all 3 marbles are to be of yellow color, it must mean that there must be 0 green marbles, so that's going to be 4C0 divided by the total selection, that 9C3. This gives us the total value of 5 by 42. So that's the probability when x takes the value of 3. Now in order to check whether the probability distribution table is correct or not, we can just sum all of these probabilities. And if it is equal to 1, then the probability distribution table is correct. If it's not, then there must have been a mistake. And we can clearly see that summing these values will 
get the value of 1, so this probability distribution table is correct. Let's move on to the third question. We need to figure out the value for expectation of x. So expectation of x is quite easy. It's just the summation of the values of x with their corresponding probabilities. All right, let's look at the values and the probabilities first. So this just means that we need to multiply these two and add the multiplication of these two, add the multiplication of these two, and again, add the multiplication of these two. That's because this takes the value of x and we need to multiply it with the corresponding probabilities, right? So that's going to be zero into one by 21 plus one into five by 14 plus two into 10 by 21 plus three into five by 42. So that's going to be 0 into 1 by 21 plus 1 into 5 by 14 plus 2 into 10 by 21 plus 3 into 5 by 42. Now this gives the total value of 5 by 3 which can be written as 1.67. So this concludes the third question. Let's move on to the fourth one. In how many different ways can the nine letters of the word telescope can be arranged? All right, let's list the total number of letters. I'm going to denote that with N, so that's going to be nine. Let's look for any repeated letters. So the first repeated letter is going to be E. And it has the frequency of one, two, and three. And I think that's the only repeating letter. All right, now we need to figure out the number of arrangements. So the number of arrangements is just going to be the total number of letters factorial divided by the repeated number of letters frequency factorial. So in this case, that's going to be n factorial divided by r1 factorial. That's 9 factorial divided by 3 factorial, which gives us the total number of arrangements at 60,480. In how many different ways can the nine letters of the word telescope can be arranged so that there are exactly two letters between T and C? All right, we know that there are nine letters. So that's going to be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. Now let's list down the scenarios for T and C. So for the first case, if T is the first letter, then we need to maintain two gaps, right? So that's going to be the gap, and then C can be here. For the second case, if T is the second letter, we need to maintain a gap of two letters and then there's C. For the third possibility, T can be the third letter and we need to maintain the gap of two letters and then there can be C. For the fourth possibility, that's T as the fourth letter, then the gap of two letters and then C. For the fifth possibility, that's T on the fifth letter two gaps, and then a C. For the sixth possibility, that's T on the sixth letter, and the two gaps, and C on the last letter. So there cannot be any more possibilities than these six. All right. But we're told that there can exactly be two letters between T and C, but we're not specified whether T is the one to be appearing first or c is the one to be appearing first so it means that there can be c in the first position t on this side c on first t here c t right so that's just double these possibilities so that's six times two so we've already considered the placements for these two letters t and c so we just need to consider the remaining seven letters in the word telescope now, for this case, the total number of letters is going to be 7 because we have already considered the two letters T and C. And the repeating letter is E and its frequency is still going to be 3. Now, let's look for the number of possible arrangements. So, let's first focus on the 7 letters. So, that's just this information. Like I said before, that's going to be n factorial by r factorial, right? But we're also going to consider the letters t and c. And for this, we've already determined that's going to be 6 times 2. So we just need to multiply this to what we've just written down. So that's going to be 6 times 2. All right, now let's substitute the values for n and r 
that's going to be 7 factorial divided by 3 factorial into 6 into 2, which gives the total number of arrangements of 10,080. This concludes the fourth question. Let's move on to the fifth one. In a certain region, the probability that any given day in October is wet is 0 0.16, independently of other days. So that's the probability, right? And we need to find the probability that in a 10-day period, so our sample is 10 days, fewer than 3 days will be wet. All right, so we can clearly determine it as a binomial distribution. So I'm just going to denote the variable x as the number of wet days. Then x follows the binomial distribution. So we're given the sample of 10 days. So n is going to have a value of 10, comma, the probability is just going to be the day being wet, which is given by 0 0.16. So that's the value for p. All right, so we know that p is 0 0.16. So we can easily figure out the value for Q. So that's just going to be 1 minus P, which is 0 0.16, which gives us the value of Q at 0 0.84. Now we need to figure out the probability that X is fewer than 3. So that's less than 3, which means that X can take the values of 0, 1, and 2. So that's going to be probability X equals to 0 plus probability X equals to 1 plus probability X equals to 2. Now let's um, list down the probability with the binomial distribution formula. So that's going to be 10C0 into 0 0.16 to the power 0 into 0 0.84 to the power 10 plus 10C1 into 0 0.16 to the power 1 into 0 0.84 to the power 9 plus 10C2 into 0 0.16 to the power 2 into 0 0.84 to the power 8. All right, I'm going to write down the probabilities till four decimal places. So that's going to be 0 0.1749 plus 0 0.3331 plus 0 0.2856. This gives us the total probability of 0 0.7936 if you are to round this off to three figures that's going to be 0 0.794 all right for the second part we need to find the probability that the first wet day in october is 8 october all right so we're looking at the first success so that's going to be a geometric distribution right this is going to be a geometric distribution and since the success is that of wet day the probability parameter p is going to be 0 0.16 and we're looking at eight days so that's one two three four five six seven eight and the first wet day is going to be on 8 october which means that first october till 7th october that's not wet days which means that we require failure in these first seven days and success on the eighth day so we're looking at this probability so the required probability is just going to be failures for seven days, right? And since we know that the probability of success is 0 0.16, the probability of failure is going to be 1 minus 0 0.16, which is going to be 0 0.84. So that's 0 0.84, but we're looking for seven days. So that's just to the power seven into the probability of success, which is just the day being wet, which is given by 0 0.16. Now this gives us the total probability of 0 0.0472. Now for four randomly chosen years, find the probability that in exactly one of these years, the first wet day in October is 8 October. All right, so we now have a sample of four years, right? And the probability that we're required to find is that in exactly one of these years, the first wet day in October is 8 October. So this is going to be the probability value P. And we already figured out this probability in the second part of the question, which is 0 0.0472. All right, so we can denote X to be the number of years in which the first wet day 
in October is 8 October. So we can clearly determine that X is a binomial distribution, right? And we have a sample of four years. So that's going to be the value of N. And for the probability B, that's the probability of success, which is that the first wet day is on 8 October, which we figured out in the second part. So that's going to be 0 0.0472. Now, if this is the probability of success, then let's look for the probability of failure. So that's going to be 1 minus 0 0.0472 which is going to be 0 0.9528. Now we're looking at exactly one of these years. So that's going to be probability x equals to 1. So this is just going to be 4c1 into 0 0.0472 to the power 1 into 0 0.9528 cube. So this gives us the final probability of 0 0.163. All right, this concludes the fifth question. Let's move on to the sixth one. The times taken in minutes to complete a particular task by employees at a large company are normally distributed. So I'm just going to denote x as the variable time taken to complete a particular task. And we're given that x follows a normal distribution, and we're given the value of mean to be 32.2, and the standard deviation is 9.6. And we're squaring it since the second parameter is that of variance and not the standard deviation. Now, for the first part, we need to find the probability that a randomly chosen employee takes more than 28.6 minutes to complete the task. So that's just the probability of x being greater than 28.6. Now, since we know that x follows a normal distribution, the first step would be to standardize. So that's going to be z greater than 28.6 minus the mean value, which is 32.2, divided by the standard deviation. So that's going to be 9.6. All right, this is probability of z greater than negative 0.375. So we've completed the first step of standardizing. So second step would be to drop the probability distribution. So this is zero, and we're looking at the value greater than negative 0 0.375, right? So that's going to be somewhere here, negative 0 0.375, and we're looking for probability greater than this. Now, if we were to use the symmetricity property and flip the diagram, this would look something like this. So that's the mean. That's a positive 0 0.375, and the probability less than this value is going to be equal to the probability greater than negative 0 0.375. So we can write it down as z is less than 0 0.375. Now, in order to find this probability, we'll have to look at the normal distribution table. All right, we're looking at the z value of 0 0.375. So 0 0.3 is right here, and... 0.37 is this value, but we also require a third decimal value of 5. So that's going to be 19. So let's add up the probability. That's going to be 0 0.6443 plus 0 0.0019. This gives us the total probability of 0 0.6462. Let's substitute this value. So this is just going to be 0. 6462. If you were to round it off to three figures, that would be 0 0.646. Now for the second part, 20% of employees take longer than t minutes to complete the task. So that's going to be value longer than t minutes. And that's the probability of 20%. So we can write it as 0 0.2, right? And since we know that x follows a normal distribution, the second step would be to standardize. So that's going to be z is greater than t minus the mean value. So we have the mean value of 32.2 divided by the standard deviation, which is 9.6. Now this will be equal to 0 0.2. Now the second step would be to drop the probability distribution. All right, this is the mean 0. And we're looking at this z value from which the greater probability is going to be 0 0.2. And since we know that the probability to the right-hand side of the mean is 0 0.5, this means that the 
value of z, which is this value, is going to be on the right hand side of the mean. So that's just t minus 32.2 divided by 9.6. So the value greater than this is 0 0.2. If the probability greater than this value is going to be 0 0.2, then this must mean that the probability less than this value is going to be 1 minus 0 0.2, which is 0 0.8. So this is the probability for which we require to find the corresponding z value from the normal distribution table. So we're looking for the probability of 0 0.80. All right, this is the closest value, right? So let's figure out the difference between 0 0.8 and 0 0.7995 so that's going to be a difference of 0 0.0005 right and the value of 5 is found on the third decimal place being 2 so the corresponding z value is going to be 0 0.842 so that's going to be z equals to 0 0.842 so let's substitute this value all right we figured this z value to be 0 0.842 right which must mean that t minus 32.2 divided by 9.6 is equal to 0 0.842 so that's t minus 32.2 9.6 this is equal to 0 0.842 now this is a simple equation so that's t minus 32.2 equals to 0 0.842 into 9.6 Alright, if we bring the value 32.2 th this side, that's going to be t equals to 0 0.842 into 9.6 plus 32.2. This gives us the final value for t as 40.3. Now for the third part, we need to find the probability that the time taken to complete the task by a randomly chosen employee differs from the mean by less than 15 minutes so we know the mean value to be 32.2 and we need to figure out the probability um, in which the time differs by less than 15 minutes all right this just means that the time can be 15 minutes lower than the standard mean value so that's going to be 32.2 minus 15 or it can be 15 minutes greater than the mean value. So that's just going to be 32.2 plus 15. So we need to figure out this probability. All right, since we know that x follows a normal distribution, the first step would be to standardize. So that's going to be 32.2 minus 15 minus 32.2 divided by the standard deviation of 9.6. And that's going to be z. That's 32.2 plus 15 minus the mean value. That's 32.2 divided by the standard deviation that's 9.6 all right so the positive 32.2 and the negative 32.2 they cancel each other now the remaining value is going to be negative 15 by 9.6 is less than z is less than positive 15 by 9.6 all right this is going to be negative 1.563 is less than z is less than positive 1.563. Since we completed the first step of standardizing, the second step would be to drop the probability distribution. All right, that's zero. That's negative 1.563. That's positive 1.563. And we need to find the probability in between this value. All right, we know that uh, from the symmetricity property, the probability between negative 1.563 and zero is equal to the probability between 0 and positive 1.563. So if we were to figure out just this portion and multiply it with 2, we'd get the entire required probability, right? In order to do so, we first need to figure out the probability less than positive 1.563, right? But we only need the probability till 0, which means that we need to subtract the probability lower than 0. That's the left-hand side, which has the probability of 0 0.5 so we need to subtract this from the total probability of x being less than 1.563 and we need to multiply it with 2 in order to figure out both sides of the probability so that's going to be 2 times probability of z being less than 1.563 minus 0 0.5 all right let's look for this probability in the normal distribution table we're looking at the z value of 
so 1.5 is right here 1.56 is going to be this value and we require the third decimal place of 3 so that's 4 let's add up the probability that's going to be 0 0.9406 plus 0 0.0004 this gives us the probability value of 0 0.941 let's substitute this value all right so this is going to be 0 0.941 minus 0 0.5 that's going to be 0 0.441 now this is going to give the total required probability of 0 0.882 this concludes the sixth question let's move on to the seventh one The distances x meter traveled to school by 140 children were recorded and the results are summarized in the table below. And we are to draw a cumulative frequency graph to represent these results. And we know that for a cumulative frequency graph, the distance is going to be on the x-axis and the cumulative frequency is going to be on the y-axis. Now let's look for the highest value of distance, so that's 1600. Alright, I'm just going to scale it first. So I'm drawing here freehand, but make sure you guys draw it with a scale. So this is the distance in meters. And we have it till 1600. So that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. All right, we can have it till right here. So that's going to be 200, 400, 600. 800, 1000, 1200, 1400, and this is going to be 1600. All right, now let's look at the cumulative frequency. Um, the highest value is 140. So let's first scale it as well. Okay, this is going to be quite difficult. So I'm kind of drawing it roughly just to give you guys an idea but make sure to use a scale all right now this is going to be the cumulative frequency and we have the highest value of 140 so if you were to scale it that's one two three four five six and seven Alright, so this can be 20, 40, that's going to be 60, 80, 100, 120, and 140. Now we just need to plot the values. So x less or equal to 200, so that's 16. So this is going to be on this side and we need to plot the value of 16 so this is going to be 10 that's 12 14 this is going to be 16. all right so that's this point right here let's look at the next point that is x less or equal to 300 that's the value of 46. so 300 is going to be right here and we need the value to be less than 46. If this is 40, this is 42, 44, 46 right there. This is the second point. Let's look for the third one. That's x is less or equal to 500. It has a value of 88. So 500 is going to be right here. And this has the value of 88. So that's going to be... 90 right here which means that this value is going to be 88 all right so the corresponding point is right here so this is the third point let's look for the fourth one that says less or equal to 900 and we have the cumulative frequency of 122 so 900 is going to be right here and we have the value 122 so that's 120, which means that 122 is right there. So I guess this point is going to be 900, yes. So that's the point. 
now that's x less or equal to 1200 and it has a cumulative frequency of 134 so 1200 is right there we already have it and we need the cumulative frequency of 134 so this is going to be 130 that's 132 that's 134 now this point is going to be right here yes so the last one is x less or equal to 1600 and that's the value of 140 so we know that 1600 was at the end and we have 140 to be right here so that's this point now let's draw a freehand curve so we draw the axis with a scale but whenever we're drawing a cumulative frequency make sure you draw it freehand so this is going to be something like this so we just keep joining the dots Alright, that concludes the first part. Now we will use our graph in order to estimate the interquartile range. So interquartile range is just going to be the upper quartile Q3 minus the lower quartile Q1. In order to figure out Q3 and Q1, we are going to use the percentile method. So if we were to list the values, there's going to be the lowest one and the highest one. In between, that's going to be the median. And in between the lowest and the median, that's going to be the lower quartile. And in between the median and the highest value, that's going to be the upper quartile. So this is going to be 0%. That's 25%. That's 50%. That's 75%. And that is 100%. So if we're using the percentile method, we're going to figure out the 25th percentile and the 75th percentile in order to figure out the lower quartile and the upper quartile. Let's look at the lower quartile first. So that's Q1, right? For Q1, the 25% of the total values, which is 140. So that's going to be 35. So this is the cumulative frequency part, and we need to figure out the corresponding distance. So let's look for the value of 35 first. So right here, that's going to be 30. So this is 36, and that's 34. So that's in between. So the corresponding point on the curve is right here this is the value so that's 300 and that's 220 230 so this value is going to be 260. so the value of lower quartile q1 is going to be 260. let's repeat the same process for the upper quartile that's going to be 75 percent of the total value of 140 which is 105 so that's the cumulative frequency. We need to figure out the corresponding distance. So 100 is right here, which means that this is 102, this is 104, this is 106. So in between, there's going to be 105. So let's look at the corresponding point on the cumulative frequency curve. So that's the point right there, which is in between 600 and 800. So that's going to be 700, which will be our upper quartile. Q3. Now the interquartile range is just going to be the difference. So that's 700 minus 260, which gives the value of 440. Now for the third part, we need to figure out the estimates of the mean and the standard deviation of the distances. All right, for the distance, we are given the cumulative range. So this is going to be the cumulative range first part that's less or equal to 200 for the second part that was less than 300 for the third part that was less than 500 then that was less than 900 less than 1200 and then less than 1600 all right if we were to write it down 
as the range value that's going to be 0 to 200 200 to 300 300 to 500 500 to 900 900 to 1200 and then 1200 to 1600 so these are the distances range right all right let's write down the mid value so if we're looking at the range of a to b then the mid value is just going to be a plus b by 2 so for this case that's going to be 0 plus 200 by 2 that's going to be 100 for the second case that's 200 plus 300 by 2 that's 250 for the third case that's going to be 300 plus 500 by 2 which is going to be 400 for this case that's 500 plus 900 divided by 2 which is 700 for this case that's going to be 900 plus 1200 divided by 2 which is going to be 1050 and for the last case that's going to be 1200 plus 1600 divided by 2 which is going to be 1400 now let's list down the corresponding cumulative frequency values that's going to be 16 46 88 122 134 and 140 but we only need the actual frequency so for the first case that's going to be 16 for the second case that's going to be the difference so 46 minus 16 which is going to be 30 for the third case that's going to be 88 minus 46 which is going to be 42 for this that's going to be 122 minus 88 which is going to be 34 for this case that's going to be 134 minus 122 which is 12 and for the last case that's going to be 140 minus 134 which is going to be 6. all right now let's figure out the mean value so mean value is just going to be summation fm divided by summation f so this is just going to be the sum of frequency into the mid values so this is going to be 100 into 16 plus 250 into 30 plus 400 into 42 plus 700 into 34 plus 1050 into 12 plus 1400 into 6 divided by the total frequency so we can see that the total frequency is going to be 140 all right this gives us the mean value of 505 and we also need to figure out the standard deviation so in order to figure out the standard deviation i'm going to figure out the variance first so this is going to be summation fm square divided by summation f minus the mean squared so let's substitute the values that's going to be 100 square into 16 plus 250 square into 30 plus 400 square into 42 plus 700 square into 34 plus 1050 square into 12 plus 1400 square into 6 divided by summation f which has the value 140 but we also need to deduct the mean squared so that's going to be 505 squared so this gives us the total value of 105,010.7143 but what we actually need to find is the variance so let's do it on the additional page so this is question 7 part c so we're looking at the standard deviation which is going to be root under variance and we already have the value for the variance is 105,010.7143 now this gives us the value of the standard deviation at 324.054 all right this concludes um, the question number seven and this brings us to the end of this set if you found this video useful make sure you hit the like button make sure to leave a comment below and make sure you subscribe and hit the bell icon in order to view more of these contents in the future thank you